Okay, thanks everybody for joining us for this last session of the Resilient Vermont Conference for 2022. It's been a really great day. I hope everybody has got some fantastic things to take away with them from today's conference. And I know that it just makes me that much more happy to live in Vermont and to know that there are just great people and a great community. So um, my name is Karen Hinkle. I'm the Associate Provost for Research. I oversee the Office of Academic Research, which houses the research centers, including the Center for Global Resilience and Security, which is putting on the conference today. And I'm really pleased first to introduce um, one of our very best Norwich students who's going to introduce um, our speaker for the, for the workshop. So this is Alyssa Brink. She is a senior at Norwich University. She's an honor student and she's majoring in architectural studies. Um, she's minoring in construction management and she has been awarded a Norwich Summer Undergraduate Research Fellowship this summer in which she's going to study and analyze urban agriculture in Detroit via vertical farming and rooftop gardens. So Alyssa, take it away. I am very honored to be here and to introduce you to Kara Rochek, who unfortunately couldn't be here with us in person today, but uh, God bless technology and she can be here and present to us all. Um, so Kara is a uh, deputy, deputy director and network manager for EAN, um, working with our network members and partners to expand our collective impact on clean energy action and emission reduction in Vermont. Uh, she came to EAN from Vermont Energy Education Program, where she was the executive director from 2014 to 2021. And prior to her work at the EEP, she spent eight years teaching courses such as environmental communication, environmental economics, current environmental issues, and children health and environment for the Community College of Vermont, Johnston State University, and the University of Vermont. She has served on the board of Planting Hope as an elected parks commissioner for the city of Montpelier and as a member of the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee. She has a bachelor's in environmental studies from Dartmouth College and a master's in renewable natural resources and development from the University of East Anglia. She lives in Montpelier with her husband and her two children and she enjoys playing on or in the water and walking and cross country skiing in the woods and listening to her children um, playing music. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I am so sorry not to be there with you. I am getting over COVID, uh, which has presented as cold symptoms to me. So I'm feeling lucky, but not lucky not to be there. Uh, I would love it if you wouldn't mind going around really quickly and just letting me know your name and what, where in Vermont you are from, assuming you're from Vermont. Would you mind doing that really quickly before I talk at you? Sorry, you want to Oh, sure. I'm Tara Kukani. I, I'm right here from Vermont. From, well, I teach at Norwich and I'm from Montpelier. Karen Hinkle. I'm a <coughs> professor at Norwich University and I live in Middlesex. Gene Krauss and I'm on the select board in Bethel. Caroline McKelvey. I work for the University of Vermont in a program called Lake Champlain Sea Grant and I live in the Bolton area. Uh, I'm Alyssa Brink, and I just live across the street in Williamstown. I'm Kevin Geiger. I work for the Two Rivers Ida Creechy Regional Commission, and I live in Palmer. I'm Lisa Kolb. I work for Vermont Emergency Management as a state hazard mitigation planner, and I live here in Northfield. I'm Carl Ettenheyer. I'm on the select board in East Montpelier. Thank you all for doing that. So my plan for today, and I'm hoping it'll work just as well digitally as it would be if I were in the room, is to give you maybe 10 minutes of context. And then my hope is that we can have some conversation because this is supposed to be a workshop, not me just presenting at you. Um, so the, the topic of conversation is, is building Vermont's climate workforce. And um, as was part of my introduction, I work for Energy Action Network, which is a pretty broad network of about 200 for-profits, nonprofits, educational institutions, um, and lots of folks who work for the state who are all working together to achieve Vermont's climate and energy commitments in ways that create a more just, thriving, and sustainable future for Vermonters. Um, one of the things that we do through that work, there's a couple of, of, of big roles we hold in the state. One is that we bring together a lot of data and analysis, and we share that through a report that goes out each year that you may have seen. But the second thing that we do is that we convene this network of people to work together towards solutions. 
Um, and each year in September or October, we uh, have a pitch process, which is a competitive process to bring together new ideas and bring together a network action team to work on um, something that is one of the solutions that our state can employ for um, meeting our energy and climate commitments. Um, so we have seven of those that are pretty active right now. Uh, four of them started in 2020, another three got added in 2021, and we're starting the process of developing some new ones for 2022. Um, those are all listed up on the screen. They vary from weatherization at scale, which has been trying to push for an additional 90,000 homes to be weatherized by 2030, um, mainly of low and moderate income folks. Uh, through to the clean heat standard, which was a policy idea that was developed um, by an action team over the course of about a year and a half. You may have heard about it. It did go through the legislature this year. It was vetoed by the governor and the uh, veto override um, narrowly did not go through by one vote. Um, there are some other network action teams. The future of rural transit has been looking at trying to combine public and school transit using electric buses and try it. That's a, a long, slow process as you might imagine, but we're working with some communities on exploring that as a concept. Um, there's, a, there's a number of others here, but the one that I wanna talk with you about today is the team that's been working on climate workforce. So that was a team that started gathering together in November of 2021. Um, we know that our climate workforce is a really important thing. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of benefits that come from growing our climate workforce. They can be excellent careers. Um, it's investing in the local economy and it's reducing emissions. Um, but it's also a real challenge. So we had Matt Barowitz from the Department of Labor come and do a presentation at one of our uh, our, our coalition meetings on climate workforce. And he showed this slide, this was in January, I'm sure he has new data since then, but you can see what we're up against in that we were already had a, a declining labor force before COVID hit. And then there was a precipitous decline. You all know this, I'm not telling you anything new, but it really does show up on this graph that we lost a lot of workers. And a lot of those were early retirements that are probably not gonna come into the workforce. And there, as you also know, are other issues that are holding some people from coming back into the workforce, including issues with childcare, housing, et cetera. So at the same time that we have that happening, um, we have had a new climate action plan be adopted. I'm sure you all heard about that this morning at the, the plenary session, but the, the new climate action plan includes 26 pathways, 64 strategies, and over 200 actions that they're recommending the state needs to make if we're gonna meet our um, climate uh, requirements from the Global Warming Solutions Act. So the image that is showing right now is just one of 15, or actually just the top of 15 pages of things that we should probably think about doing in order to reach our goals. And along the way, this is also something that I think Jared Duvall, my colleague shared this morning. Um, there's, there's, you know, you can you can dive into individual actions that we are going to need to take. And this graphic shows the highest impact strategies that we might want to take. Uh, I don't know how much Jared described this this morning, but the purple lines on each of these graphs are what we're likely to get through business as usual, the policies we already have in place, whereas the increasing bar graphs are what we would actually need to do to reach our, our climate goals through the climate action plan. So for example, you can see the ramp up of electric vehicles. While we're expecting that those will ramp up fairly rapidly, we're gonna need to see a lot more than is even the business as usual. But even with business as usual, we're gonna see a big increase. And that means jobs, that means jobs installing electric chargers, that means people learning to service electric vehicles instead of diesel and gasoline vehicles. Um, air source heat pumps, similar. We need a lot of people who know how to install those. Weatherization, again, whether we're looking at business as usual or what we actually need to do to reach our, our climate action plan, we're gonna see a big ramp up and we need a lot more workers in that field. Continue on, these are, these are the additional um, top measures for getting us to our climate action goals. So. 
whether we look at business as usual or whether we actually look at our goals, we need more people in the field working at, in these jobs. I'm going to take a quick pause and ask if there's any questions since I can't see you closely. Should I keep going? Yep, go ahead. Yeah. Great. So we've had a really broad coalition of people talking about how do we address the climate, um, climate workforce needs. And in those conversations, it's been a broad conversation about climate workforce, and there's been a more specific conversation around weatherization workforce, um, because weatherization is a really good thing to do first. You know, you can't you can't put in some of the the new you know like um, heat pumps as effectively until you've weatherized the building. So it's one of those you know first things that we want to be working on. Um, so we've had a lot of conversations about what are the things you need to have in place in order to build the climate workforce that we need. Um, and one of those needs is consistent funding. So we're in this beautiful moment in terms of money in that there actually is money to do some of this work, which is somewhat unusual. Um, the, the American Rescue Plan Act funds um, give us funding for a lot, of, a lot of work to be done between now and 2026. But we know that we need that funding to stay consistent because one of the issues that have, has happened in the past is that there have been sometimes slugs of money that come in but their short term, it doesn't give a company enough time to build up its workforce and then maintain them and, and be able to maintain good quality jobs. And so it's it's hard to get the work done because you don't have that, that ramp up and that continuation of funding. So that's one of the things we need in order to provide good and fair wages and benefits and job security, which are all needed to get people into, the, into these jobs. Um, another thing that we really need is wraparound services. And this is where the conversation gets so big and broad that it can be, it can say, okay, we need to do everything all at once. But it is true that we need to make sure that we have housing for workers who may not be making as much money. Um, we need transportation for people to get to their jobs. We desperately need childcare if we're going to allow our entire population to be able to be in the workforce. Some people need health or mental health care in order to be able to, to stay in the workforce. And we have a lot of new Americans coming in who have great skills and work ethic, um, but may not have the language skills yet. So there needs to be some translation services to be able to maximize our workforce as well. And then there's there's also, we've had a lot of the training providers involved in the, our conversations, which has been great. And we have a lot of training in the state. There's the, the colleges, obviously, the career and tech ed centers that students can be in from high school. And then there's a lot of nonprofits working in the field, like Resource is doing great work. Vermont Works for Women, um, Vermont Adult, Adult Basic Education, BYCC and Audubon. And there's a lot of organizations that are using a sort of serve, earn, and learn model where they actually pay people to go through the trainings. And that can be really helpful for anyone. Um, it can be very hard to step out of your life in order to get trained to do something else. Um, and a lot of a lot of employers are are training their their folks on the job as well. Um, people also need to be able to see what the clear career pathway is. So there's this really cool tool I was just going to show you. I'm going to go out of this the PowerPoint and show you this live. So this is a, a neat tool that. I want to set this, but Green Buildings Career Map is what it's called. Um, and they have this for sort of green buildings. They have it for renewable energy as well. But what someone can do is they can say, okay, I'm interested in learning about, you know, insulation, air, air sealing technician. That sounds like something I might be interested in going into. So if I go in as an entry level, where does that take me? And what other options could I have going onward? Um, and you can see that, okay, well, if, I, if I'm doing that, well, maybe I would go on and I would become a commercial construction for a person and that, that could be the next stage of my career. And then what might I do? There's these other options. So this is just one of many, but this, this sort of a visualization helps people to understand that when they're stepping into a job, it's, it has a future and they can, can think about where they might wanna keep going. So those sorts of tools are really helpful as well. So that is the conversation that I've been having with lots of people that I wanted to bring to you. And I would love to know if you all have any questions or comments. And then what, where I'm hoping that we'll go with this is, um, I think we have some post-it notes and some markers in the room. And I wanted to share a few questions I have for you. 
and have you take a, a minute or two, a few minutes to, to write out some thoughts. And then we'll have a conversation about what you know about what's happening in your community, what some of the opportunities are, where you are, share some ideas. That's where I was hoping we would go with this. But are there any questions or comments on what I've shared so far? Questions, comments? Now, cool tool. Uh, at, at Lake Champlain Senior in particular, like we, our funding is through NOAA to a certain degree, and uh, workforce development is high on that list, especially with funding that's coming through um, as well. So I'm intrigued to look a little bit more at that one. I think it's a little bit outside of our, our realm of like construction engineering type thing, so I'd like to, to dive in more to that for that website. Very cool. Yeah. I think that's it for questions, Cara. Great. Okay, I'm going to throw my questions to you up here. Um, and I'm hoping that you all can just take a moment to think about, okay, what's happening in your community that, that could help develop the climate workforce? So what things do you already know about? What are the needs in your community for further building the climate workforce? And who should be involved in finding the solutions? And then I'd like to have a conversation about that. And when I say community, there's so many different ways you could slice and dice that, that might be um, your work community, it might be the physical community where you live, it might be any other communities you're involved with, faith-based or, um, you know, service service clubs or, you know, whatever those pieces are that are in your life. And if it, if we have some, do we have some post-it notes and some markers that we could pass out to folks? Yeah, sure do. Give people a couple minutes. And what I was thinking is if you can write ideas, write one per post-it note, um, that you have for these three questions, and then we'll go through and we'll talk about them afterwards. So I am having a little trouble hearing you all. So if I'm, I guess if you can speak up, <clears throat> that would be great. And if I can't hear you, I'll let you know. Okay, sounds good. Okay. Oh, awesome. So Cara is able to put our thoughts up on um, a working document. So yeah, that's my plan is to use post-it notes to keep track of some of these. Um, but I welcome any you know, conversation. And I will say that this is actually really useful to me too. I'm, I'm hoping to help you share ideas or ask you to share ideas with one another. And we're still in the gathering of ideas um, space as well, both in terms of what's happening and in terms of where you know, things might go for the next legislative session, where there might need to be more funding, where there might be great things that we should be looking at. So. I'm grateful for anything that you have to share today. So the first question I asked is what's happening in your community that can help develop the climate workforce? Why don't we start there? I'm wondering if folks have anything to share. Go ahead. Kate, can you hear me, Cara? I can. Okay, great. Um, why is this a community issue at all? I, why is it a community issue? Why is it a community issue at all? Um, towns have a lot on their plates. Uh, it's the state is trying to reach a goal. Why doesn't the state weatherization mobile just drive around the street ringing their bell, giving that ice cream, and say, "We'll come and put in your water heater while we're at it." You know, the state is doing that for low for the lower income um, folks. The weatherization assistance program provides free weatherization. And recently they have gotten funding that allows them to also, at the same time, when appropriate, replace heating plants and heat pump and water heaters for heat pump hot water heaters. Um, and to do additional work that allows all that to happen because sometimes you can't weather areas if the, if the roof is leaking, for example. But they have to find the people to do the work. And so they're struggling to find the people to do the work, even though they have a fair amount of funding right now for that work. So the question is, where do we find those people who are willing to step into that hot, dusty attic um, and do the work? Uh, they also have recently increased the, how much they pay per hour, which will hopefully be helpful in getting finding and re retaining workers because I think it's going up by about $3 an hour, which is a pretty big jump uh, starting July 1st. But even so, it's hard to find the people. Where do we find the people? So I took it for the community aspect. I'm um, thinking of Lake Champlain Sea Grant, and I'm thinking in particular, my uh, couple supervisors up has really focused on salt 
um, and salt reduction in, in Vermont or the basin in, in, in total. And it's interesting because it's, it's got to be the road crews. And what we're realizing is it's very hard to get a hold of road crew individuals for many reasons, um, but that she is leading salt summits that in the off season, aka during summertime and things like that, where road crews aren't necessarily starting salt by having them come and talk about, hey, why is it important to calibrate your machine and X, Y, or Z? So um, that's something that's happening. But I think then when I took it as a community as well in my personal community in Bolton, um, it's we have extremely bad erosion problems. We are on a mountain, our road, and so our road crews are just, they're sanding, and I just, even living there a year and a half, I've seen that the road has already increased probably like three, four, five inches, and that's causing issues in our personal driveway. And so I think the amount of time that they grade, because I think we're such a small town that they're almost like looking for things to do, is like, let's grade the road. Um, the town they can help. <laughs> yeah, so, um, I think that there's opportunities out there to work with road crews to know why you only add X amount of salt or X amount of gravel or things like that because it, you can see the sides of our road right now are just encompassed by loads and loads of sand, which obviously are going to go into the stream of the rivers and have exponential impacts later down the road. So two different views of the community aspect, but I think road crews are an important aspect of that climate workforce. Um, that you can kind of target to hopefully do some sort of education um, side of things. One approach. <clears throat> so through the Sea Grant program, you're able to do some of those trainings. You're able to provide them. Yeah, yes and no. Obviously, we're a smaller organization too, so you can only do so many trainings. And there's between New York and Vermont, because that's all part of the basin. That's quite a few towns. It's like 300 plus towns. Uh, so there's, you can't be in 300 towns to do with each and every single road crew that you try and rope them all in, but it doesn't quite work out that way. And I've heard similar things about it, it can be hard to, you have to find the right timing for the training. And it can be hard to, <clears throat> if you're already trying to ramp up your workforce, say in weatherization, which is what I'm more familiar with, and yet you want to train those people you also want to be fully having them in the field doing their work so it can be it can be a hard balance to to find what else is going on in, in communities that can help develop the workforce that you're aware of anything yeah i was also thinking of outreach activities especially at the university we do a lot of outreach and it starts with k-12 and i'm wondering what the age is of the folks who can start off in uh, projects like weatherization. So for example, can high school juniors and seniors take it on as a, high, as a summer job um, and, and get into the profession that way and, and start out and make some good money over the summer and then uh, find their path as, as you pointed out earlier. And I know Shelburne Farms has been doing just an excellent job with training educators uh, and, and helping them bring more climate education in schools and universities in just excellent best practices and models. So in terms of yeah. training workforces. Yeah, I think those are both really good um, points. Sorry, I can't always think and type at the same time. So if I pause awkwardly, that's what's going on. Um, it is interesting finding the bite-sized pieces that could be carved off for a summer job um, because again you can't train someone in a you know it takes three months to train someone to be a full weatherization worker but um, there may be specific aspects of that job or there may be other jobs that that um, are climate jobs that could go to youth and definitely starting training younger. I think that that's a really good point as well. Um, it's not just when students are, when young people are 18, there's there's a need for that training earlier on and later on. It's not just the 18 to 25 year olds either who need the training. Any other thoughts on this one? The town of Bethel is uh, with the Otoquichi Two Rivers Planning, uh, Regional Planning Commission is rezoning to 
make it possible for more multifamily dwellings and smaller properties along the roadways. Uh, hopefully, because we're finding that you can offer somebody a job, but they don't can't find some place to live, uh, and even, and then they can't find childcare. So, but the so we're working to rezone uh, so that we can uh, hopefully provide housing for people. I would also comment that uh, our the contractors in the area, local building people. They're booked for the next year and a half. There are not enough of them to do the work that they are now as seeking to do, let alone uh, weatherizing 100-year-old uh, houses like I live in. So uh, that's a real issue. Uh, just is a real issue. And it's a chicken or egg situation. We need the housing to have more workers to build more housing. To it, it does feel that way sometimes. It's like, what? Well, how do we? How? Where's the leverage point where we can start? But I think that that is a really good uh, example. The rezoning for more multifamily dwellings, and I've heard of more multifamily dwellings being put in in some areas around Chittenden County as well. Um, I, I think it's really important, and hope that the that the um, standards that are in place on those buildings mean that they get built so they don't need to be weatherized later and they get done right the first time around. Um, but that's great. Any other thoughts on this one? Well, we have a new community center serving Washington County and, and Barrie, or at least some portion of Washington County. So um, that is an opportunity to provide, uh, I say community center, I mean career center. An uh, opportunity to provide yeah. training for uh, high school age students in all sorts of building related careers. Yeah, and the those career te and tech ed centers are doing great work in bringing youth along. It's I, I had the chance when I was with Vermont Energy Education Program to travel around and do sort of a listening tour at some of the career tech ed centers, and it was interesting to see how vastly different they are. The one in Newport. Um, sends more students to college than the actual high school there does. It's massive and it's like, it looks like a college. And then there's some that are very small and they're sort of um, serving more of the students who are struggling in the traditional educational setting. And I'm, I'm hopeful that um, we'll continue to grow those so that they serve whoever wants to be there um, and to be learning in that way at a slightly younger age, sort of hands-on and technical work. All right, how about this second question? Um, what are additional needs that you know of in your community that could be helpful? Maybe we've already named a lot of those. Child care and a well-paid child care workforce. Yep. Other gaps that you know about? Anything that we didn't name already? I was thinking, Clara, is there, I think a gap that constantly comes to mind is not knowing who's doing what already. And so I don't know if I'm reinventing the wheel because that program already exists, or do we really generally need new programming or new direction as a case? And yes. especially with the state kind of coming up with the new climate office or the, some of the new setup for the climate action plan, I wonder if that might be a good place to house some of these things, like if the workforce development is in support of the climate and energy and, and these sectors, then could there be a centralized body that, that at least has a, a, an ongoing list of who's doing what? Because where that list is housed was always the question because who's going to maintain it? Yeah. Part of it's in my head and lots of other people's heads, but how do you actually make that accessible to, to others? 
Yeah. All right, how about that final question? Who should be involved in finding solutions? So I was curious, the very first, the very first comment um, that we heard was, it should be, shouldn't be on the communities. It should be, or if I'm, I may be paraphrasing this wrong, you can correct me, I would welcome that. But more that um, the state should be doing more, it shouldn't be on the communities. Um, I think, I guess my feeling is, we're all in this together and, and we need everybody to be helping to find the community or helping to find the solutions. So I'm curious, you know, what groups or what, um, what structures might be in place to help find solutions? Well, well what I meant by that comment was if the state is serious, which is not for sure, um, then they need to make this very easy for people to do. People who don't have a lot of time, uh, people who are working, you know, it can't be like waiting for the cable guy to show up and I gotta leave work here. It's gotta be easy um, to the point of, of just like raising your hand and people come and do it type thing. Easier than getting cable installed. Um, and since it's a state goal, the state should have its people move it. Now, there is a lot of, to me, work that can be done by churches or the capstone agency, or you name it, to explain to people, like, listen, they're for real, they'll come to your house, they don't rip out your wall if you don't want to, you know, that's your favorite window, whatever the things are, to do that kind of explaining about the program. But from the user side, I think we, we make these things complicated when they need to be literally like a 911 call, like 811, and they say, and they give you the address, and you come and do it while they're at work, and they come home, and there's just a new water heater there, like, or a weatherization, whatever it is, it's got to be super, super easy. Yep, I hear you. It's hard to coordinate all of those things. Yeah. And it's hard for anyone to know everything that's going on, especially if it's not your day job and everything that's available to people. There is a new program of uh, finance, financial and energy navigators out of the community action programs, which I think is a fabulous model. I'm very excited about um, Capstone Community Action and Barry is sort of coordinating it, but all of the community action programs around the state have someone who's been hired to help coach people on the financial, both finances and energy. So what can they do to save money, but in particular looking at their home and transportation needs, et cetera. And those people will be well-versed in all of the different programs that are happening, but you really need that across the board. That's mainly gonna be for low and moderate income people. You need it for people at all, at all, and at all levels of, of the spectrum and for landlords, because a lot of people obviously don't own their own home and can't make those choices for themselves necessarily. Any other thoughts on that question? Or any other thoughts in general? I know it's the end of a long day and I'm sitting looking at you on a screen, but I'd love to hear if you have any other thoughts about climate workforce, the needs or the opportunities that you're aware of that you'd be interested in sharing with one another. I think it's just important to find partnerships. You know, even the, the reason I'm here at this conference is that even though my background specialty might not necessarily be in hazard resilience, we're looking for the partnership saying, hey, we've got the funds and the resources to be the moderator and run that Zoom call and that web series. And you're the one that's giving out EPA grant funding right now to municipal officials. We'll find municipal officials to come listen to that webinar, but I'm not gonna present on that one. That's not my specialty. And so just that partnership of you can't carry everything yourself, but it does take effort to make the partnerships and it's, it can't be a one way street. Um, but you also need people to pick up those phone calls or put in the effort to or have the same schedule as you. You know, the list goes on and on of where potential hurdles can be. Yeah, I think one of the themes that I'm hearing from you all is around communication. 
communication and partnerships to me there there's a similarity there it's it's the how do you know where the information is coming from how do you know how to get good information how do you know who's doing what so that you can call on them and um know who to reach out to does that sound like it's kind of a theme a theme in the room it is but there's also the balance with there's too much information you know um we've some of websites including where we're sitting today and one of the issues with websites is that everything's on it which means you can't find anything and it's a, i think everyone struggles to find that balance how do you hand out that information but do it in a clear and concise way when you're trying to convey forty thousand different messages and it goes back to kevin's point of we have people we're a lot of us are just trying to make it through the day and we only have so much mental capacity to face what's in front of us. And now you're asking me to go chase down even something as simple as putting in a website to find somebody to come take care of something that's not my immediate need. And I think when we talk about communication, it just it's that that's that hard balance. How do you communicate everything you have to communicate in a way that you're not overwhelming people who are already overwhelmed? It is I like the ice cream truck approach. Yeah. And you know what I mean? Like, as re ridiculous as it sounds. No. So, like, if you're out in front of my house and you're saying, I'm going to come in and do an energy audit, I'm going to be like, okay, if I have to put it on my calendar, as conscientious as I am as a person, it, I'm going to struggle to do that. People want to do good things. They want to avail themselves of, the, of all of these opportunities. They just don't have the individual capacity to do so. I know the problem, I don't have a solution. But I think that's the balance we're trying to find. Yeah, so it's not just communication. It's, it's again, going back to that, you got to make it really, really easy. Um, and I think part of the communication piece is also that it's, it really does come down to human beings. You know, we can have all of this, these cool tools like when I showed you earlier, and we can have all of these um, resources but a lot of it comes down to who can i actually call up and ask the question <laughs> because i trust them so i guess that's part of what we need to build up is those those resources and how do we make it as simple as possible and if i could as an example most people do not know that the american red cross will put in smoke detectors for free i people didn't know, that. know that I, most people and it's not across the board but most do I happened upon, the only reason I found that out is because we lived in an area where actually the fire department had a grant to put them in. I got our whole house done for free. So I moved, which we do all the time, and I started asking around and I accidentally found the Red Cross program that came in and probably put in $50 worth of smoke detectors in a house that never had a smoke detector. I'm exceptionally brilliant. It took me time to figure that out. I start telling people about it, and they're like, I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't know. Again, it, it, and if you ask the American Red Cross, they'll tell you, oh, we tell everybody. So it's just that practical, if they were just driving down the street and say, would you like us to go I like Kevin's idea. I think it's the I, answer I mean, to I'm, I'm, I'm serious, because if we need the person to call the Red Cross, we have lost the battle. Yeah. We need the Red Cross to show up in their driveway on Saturday morning and say, we'll play with your kids. Don't worry about it. Here's a biscuit for your dog. We are coming in. Just take water heater off the truck. You know, it'll be an hour. Boom. We got 80,000 of these things to do in the next seven years, folks. Or 100,000. It, it, is, it is national guard mobilization time. It is not develop a program, hope you make the call and do the website back. Right, but we need the people to do the work too. So I, I mean, part of me is wondering, like, are there people who would come out of retirement to do some of these? And maybe it's not the installing the weatherization, but maybe it's the person driving the ice cream truck for weatherization, right? Or the, the you know what you know what I mean? Like, are there people who could do some of this hand-holding and talking to people and letting people know what's happening? Um, who might not otherwise want to be in the workforce. That's an idea I just came up with from listening to you. There's a program, AmeriCorps Seniors. I used to run an RSVP. It's AmeriCorps Seniors. It's a nationwide program that the government is piling money into right now. And it is a group of volunteers, 55 and older, um, who serve their community. 
That is a, and again though, each of those programs is individually run and they have their individual needs. It is finding that, yes, there, there's our answer. That, that, and then they can go out and do what they do best is find volunteers and with certain skill sets, but then you're gonna have a liability issue, the attorney, I mean, there's gonna be a liability issue. So again, it's that whole, goes back to the state is in the best position to make that happen because they can use their resources to make all those connections and make the program work. Yeah. Problem solved. Yeah. <laughs> what's, that, what's that program called again? It's RSVP. It's um, RSVP, so Retired and Senior Volunteer Program. They just changed their name because, of course, we have to spend money on name changes all the time. And it's AmeriCorps Senior. So if you if you follow that, um, they go. and there is one. There are some in Vermont. That is a really cool thought, Lisa, because I've been thinking about galvanizing retired engineering colleagues and thinking about needs of, so Kevin, I talked to you this morning, uh, just in terms of municipal municipalities that struggle with finding the, the trained professionals. And it's not even to do the final project, which could go to a, a formal technical firm, but to do the scoping of what, where are the gaps, what do we need, what's the timeline, what's the budget, and just get some of that initial planning done, which hopefully minimizes liability. And it, I, I didn't know about this program, so it's really exciting to hear. But it could be that, you know, like I, I really need colleagues who are retired but not, they, they just don't want the whole day tied to the desk, but they're still interested in helping and especially for community work. Um, that's great, thank you. This is cool. That's also a part of summer job for college students. Uh, if communities can afford that. Right now, we can afford a lot on the money that's floating around through ARPA. Um, um, yes and no. Yes and no, <laughs> I, right. As, as a select board member, uh, we need to be incentivized to use the ARPA money for this crisis. We're not being, it's too easy to use the ARPA money to maintain the roads and keep doing what we've always been doing without uh, hiring somebody to do the research into electric vehicles for dump trucks and, and snow plows and sidewalk plows. Uh, we don't have the staff that can do that. We don't have volunteers who say, I got a day job, I can't do it. Uh, we need to hire people at, at the community level who can watch for the grants, get the money, you know, tell us, well, there's some ARPA money here you can use for this. Right now, we're trying to figure out what to do with ARPA, but it's, it's not going to go to climate change unless there is some real incentivizing for local communities to use that ARPA money in ways they, that it's money that they would not have had otherwise. They can keep on keeping on. That's great, but it's not going to solve crime. It's kind of the ice cream truck for, for villages. Wow. Right, and there's, I don't know how much uh, the Vermont Clean Cities Coalition is reaching out to communities, and I don't know how connecting ARPA is, but I know they have information on some of the technologies you were talking about in terms of, you know, the electric street sweeper or whatever those pieces are. Um, it's one of the information sources. That's good feedback, thank you. I would say also working with the college age level, like I know Sea Grant in particular has gotten funding through NOAA and up above to fund um, students, they're, uh, I'm not gonna use the correct terminology, the families that they're first generation college age students. So not only is it then paying for their internship throughout the school year, but it's then those students uh, showing what programs they're interested in and Sea Grant then works trying to, again, that partnership aspect to reach out to people in green infrastructure throughout and saying, 
hey, we've got this intern, they're part of our program, you know, here's their, their cover letter, this is their background, and then because the student has, said, it has expressed interest in that field, it's not them necessarily going and looking for that job, it's through the organization saying, hey, reach out to these people, will pay, like, C Grant literally pays their internship, but the internship is through another organization that specializes in what that student is interested in. So that's where that partnership comes into play. If, hey, we've got the funding to pay them, but we don't have that internship here. What's your, where can you, as a green infrastructure X, Y, or Z, get a college-age student to come do that, et cetera? Yeah. Thanks for that idea as well. There are, are probably also a lot of these jobs that do not require a college education and a six-figure debt load when you graduate. Mm -hmm. So how do we incentivize people to not feel second class or less than because they choose to be a contractor or a heat and heater installer or a plumber, uh, electrician. I mean, those are, uh, maybe we make them college courses and then, <laughs> but the, the trades that we need are not necessarily those who are going to be college graduates. We need to learn how to value that. Absolutely. I completely agree with you. I think we're supposed to be done now, and I don't, at, at 5.15, I'm not sure if that's you. I'm happy to keep talking, um, but I also don't want to keep you sitting inside if you would like to go and enjoy this beautiful evening. I will throw up here my email address, cara at eanvt.org would get to me, and I'm really happy to continue any conversations, to invite anyone into, um, you know, some of the conversations I know are happening, or just to answer questions if more ideas come to you if more if, if specific questions I, I i'm a person who connects people it's one of the things that i like to do so I welcome continued conversation and i'm really grateful that you stuck around for this conversation and sorry i couldn't have been in the room there with you thank you thank you thank, thank you so you. much Cara. i think this is really productive conversation so thank you again thank you, thank you. Thank you.